Greetings to all of you. This is Archbishop Palandri Zuroche uh, of Gatineau, also Apostolic Administrator of Mont Laurier, with you again to assure you of my prayers and my solidarity in this difficult time that we are living. Uh, before I enter into the readings of today, I, I would like to uh, just make an announcement. I want to thank those of you who subscribe to our diocesan YouTube channel. Um, but I've decided that I will not be uh, broadcasting or transmitting uh, my celebrations during Holy Week over the internet. It's very complicated. It, it requires a lot of preparation, a lot of energy, and a lot of time. And I decided I would devote myself instead to continuing this exercise that I've set myself to, to meet with you every day to reflect on the readings. Um, in the hopes that, that you can take these readings to heart, uh, read them for yourselves, reflect on them. Maybe if you're with others, sit down with the others, read these readings, share around them. There are a lot of broadcast masses. We can follow mass on TV, on the internet. Many people are doing this. I would like to offer something different pastorally. I, I think this is worthwhile. Many of you are telling me that they're they're profiting from this, uh, what I'm doing. So I would like to continue doing this. And I, I hope you understand. We will be uh, informing people on the diocesan website of the schedule of the Pope's masses uh, that you will be able to follow on TV. So uh, that's what I've decided to do. Also, uh, before we get into the readings, I'd like to say a word about uh, fatherhood, paternity, because this is going to be a theme that's going to come back in, in both readings, the first and the gospel reading. Um, paternity, maternity, the idea of, of giving birth, I, I think if we think about it in the broader sense of simply being a biological father or mother, it has something to do with being fruitful. Huh? It, it, life wants to generate life. Life wants to bring more life about. And, and it is, I guess, part of the, uh, the, the fact of being uh, an animal species that we want to procreate, that, that we want to make sure that the species goes on. But individually, there's something more, more powerful here at work is that, is that even for us to be fully alive, we need to be giving life. Now, one way of giving life is to have children of our own. Obviously, that's not my way of giving life. I've, I've felt called and I've accepted to try to give life another way. My, my life is fruitful in another way. So there are other ways of being fruitful than being a biological father, a biological mother. But we're all called to be fruitful. As a matter of fact, the, the 20th century psychologist Eric Erickson spoke about, he, he coined the word generativity, you know, from to engender generativity. It's also close to the word generous. It means to, to bring new life about. And he says it's, it's, the, it's the fundamental challenge of those who are over 40, 45 years old to ask themselves and to see in my life, if I, am I giving life to the people around me? Am I giving life to the world after me also, particularly, you know? Will, will my life be a contribution to the life of those who come after me to future generations. So when, when in scripture we see the word father, when we think of God as our father, let's keep in mind that it is, it is this deep sense of life generating life, life giving more life and making those who are alive more alive around us. So let's dig into these readings, Genesis 17, three to nine. Uh, it's the story of God establishing a covenant with Abram. His name at this point is Abram. Uh, Abram was the first, historically, according to the Bible, who entered into relationship with God, Yahweh, that God chose to, uh, to reveal himself to Abram. And so here's Abram, who's 99 years old. Now, the one of the important points here is that Abram and his wife have never been able to have children. Uh, neither has been able to, to be fertile. Whose fault is it? Who knows? But here he is, 99 years old, no descendants. And particularly in this time when 
death is seen as the end. There is nothing beyond death. I only can imagine some kind of life beyond death through my children. You know, that they will carry on my, my inheritance. They will carry on my name. What I've built in my life, I will hand on to them and they will be able to make it fruitful. So, so in that perspective, not having children is, is a curse, is a deep source of sadness for Abraham for Abram and Sarah. So the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will make you exceedingly numerous. God is going to make a covenant, uh, an understanding, a binding agreement. Uh, in, in this, because of this agreement, he's saying, Abram, will become numerous. So Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. I commit myself to this. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. It really is unbelievable that at the age of 99 and Sarah, I don't know how old Sarah was, comparative age, that they would have a child. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. Ham is part of the, the Hebrew word for many. You, your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. You see, here, here the, the notion of fruitfulness, of generativity. You, your life will give life. Your life will be fruitful. It's a promise it's a promise that, how can you say, my life is not meaningless. It's not closed in on itself, but it goes on. And for Abraham, that it goes on through others. God continues, I will make nations of you. Kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all the land of Canaan for a perpetual holding, and I will be their God. As for you, God continues, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. Now, note here that, that uh, God is saying offspring uh, as a singular, it's a collective expression, not your your descendants, but your offspring. One word, one word. And uh, the Christians, the early Christians, will read back into this that when God is speak to a Abraham, he's actually he's actually speaking of one descendant in particular, who would be Jesus. You know, and we'll come back to that in the gospel. Uh, when when Isaac will be born, the name Isaac, the, the son of Abraham and Sarah, the, the name Isaac means God's la God laughs. It's, it's God laughs and it's the joy. Uh, and, and Sarah laughs, Abraham's joy. It really is a covenant of joy that is being proposed to Abraham here. So we move to John's Gospel, John chapter 8, verse 51 to 59. Jesus said to the people, very truly, very truly, we're translating the expression, amen, amen. It's when Jesus says this in God, in John's gospel, it's a way of saying what's coming here is a solemn pronouncement. I tell you, he says, whoever keeps my word will never see death. Jesus is saying that whoever abides in his words has eternal life. This life that is deeper than physical life, that, that runs in the depths of ourselves, in the essence of what we are, this life is grounded in God's very being. This life is beyond physical life, and it gives meaning to all physical life. He's saying, Whoever keeps my word will never see physical death. 
We'll never see spiritual death either if we keep his word. The Jews don't understand him. They think he's speaking simply of physical death. And he says, well, now we know that you have a demon. In other words, that you're possessed. You know, Abraham died. They had been speaking about Abraham. He, they say, Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say, whoever keeps my word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? Our father, you know, they claim to come from Abraham. We spoke about this yesterday. He died. The prophets died. Who do you claim to be? This is the fundamental question in John's gospel. Who is Jesus? The identity of Jesus is at the heart of all the discussions that, Jews, that Jesus has with his opponents. And it's the question that is posed to each one of us here and now. Who is Jesus for us? Who do you claim to be, they say. And actually in Greek, the, the, the expression is a strange expression. Who do you make yourself to be? There's an American expression, the self-made man, kind of, there's the ideal of the self-made man, you know, the, the person who's able through his own means to uh, conquer all obstacles and come out on top, the self-made man. And this is what they're saying, who do you make yourself to be? Jesus answers, I don't make myself to be anybody. He doesn't say it that way, he uses John's words, John's vocabulary, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. If I build myself up, it's nothing. It's empty. It is my Father who glorifies me. It is my Father who builds me up. My identity comes from Him. Who I am comes from Him. To call God the Father is to say that God is the source of all life. That God is the God who, who is so full of life that it spills over into more and more abundant life. And, and Jesus receives his own life from the Father. It is all from the Father. His very being is grounded in his Father. The source of life, he receives it. And then he hands it on to us. He hands it on to us. If we abide in his word, then we will never die. We will know this life also. And we ourselves will become source of life. This is a, this is a remarkable uh, saying because, because what it implies is that we are not called to be self-made men or self-made women. We do not generate life of ourselves. We receive life and we hand it on to others. The, the life that we can give to others comes to us, first of all. We are made alive and then we make others alive around us. We are first the fruit of God's love and then we can bear fruit. It is my Father who glorifies me. He of whom you say he is our God, though you do not know him. But I know him. He's so close to God, Jesus is. If I would say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. Jesus said, those who keep my word will never die. Jesus is saying, I keep my father's word. It's because Jesus' word comes from the father that if we keep Jesus' word, then we also are tapping into the source of life. Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. First of all, he says, your ancestor. He comes, he, he claims not to, not to have Abraham as father, but to have God as his father. And he, this is what he wants. He wants all of us to seek our, our identity, not in, in this, you know, uh, this family or this nation or this belonging or this group or this tribe or this ethnici ethnicity. He wants us to find our identity in the source of life itself, which is God. Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and he was glad. You see, this is where I'm saying that, you know, the, when, you, when you take that sentence, 
in the Old Testament when, when God says to Abraham, this covenant is between me and your offspring. He, Jesus is saying here, I am the offspring that, that Abraham saw. So Abraham saw it like a prophet sees the future. Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. So that Abraham's joy is not just in his son Isaac, it's not just in his grandchildren it's or in the idea that there are many nations. His joy is in the very person of Jesus. This is what Jesus is claiming. While the Jews say to him, this doesn't make sense. You're not 50 years old yet. And you have seen Abraham? Abraham had lived 1,800 years before Jesus. You're not 50 and you're telling us you saw Abraham? And Jesus answers this Again, very solemn statement, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. I remember as a, a child hearing this in church, this sentence, and my first reaction was, there's a grammatical error here. Before Abraham was, normally you would say, I was, you know, or I existed. Before Abraham existed, I was. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. The, Jesus is claiming kind of a, 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 a rootedness of his very being in eternity, be, before all time. Of course, John's Gospel starts with that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and, and through him all things were made. And this word, this eternal word, became flesh. And this is Jesus. This is John's teaching all the way through. So that the very being of Jesus is rooted, is Jesus is this word incarnate whose existence is before time and beyond time. He who was and is and will be forever and ever. This is, Jesus here is revealing his deep identity. I am rooted in the very eternity of God. And at the same time, he's echoing God's name. When, when Moses asks God, who are you? God answers, I am who I am. This is what we translate by Yahweh. I am who I am. Go to Pharaoh and tell him, I am sent you. I am the one who is. This is God's name that the Jews did not pronounce and still do not pronounce. They only say the name, Hashem. They say the name, the name. Jesus is claiming this name for himself because his identity comes from the one who is forever. At this point, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Of, co of course, they wanted to. They wanted to stone him to death because what he had just said was obviously uh, a blasphemy, a heresy. He's claiming basically to be, to be God. And, and, and so what do we need to take from this? I, I think what we need to take from this is this deep conviction that here and now we are all called to be fruitful. It's just, you know, a lot of people say, well, if you not recognize Jesus as your Savior, then you will be saved. But it's not just about us. It's about, it's about all those around us. We need to become sources of life for others. This is what it means to be grounded in Jesus, who is the Son of the Eternal Father. The Father gives life to Jesus. Jesus gives us this life so that we might give life to others. We become kind of part of an eternal dance of life. So how do we give life to those around us right now, here and now? How are we being fruitful here and now? This is the challenge for us. And we can't do it unless we tap into the source of life, who is Jesus. And so this is my prayer for you, that you be fruitful, that you be life givers, that you exercise your paternity and your maternity in the deepest sense of the word, here and now, wherever you might be. And with this prayer of mine, I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.